packet pushers. Welcome to the IP Physics Buzz, where we dare to dive into the 128-bit outer space wormhole. I'm Ed Orley. And I'm Scott Hogue. On the show, we discuss all things IPv6, strategy, design, deployment, and operations. And I'm Tom Coffeen. We've spent 20 plus years working with the IPv6 protocol. We run a consulting firm where we get IPv6 working for our customers. And we're here to share some lessons learned on how to avoid common mistakes. We're glad you joined us today. Today, we're going to be talking about Windows and CLAT. And so I guess we should do a little bit of introduction about what that is all about, because for those that aren't familiar with CLAT and maybe with 464 XLAT, they might be scratching their head and going, what are these guys talking about today? We can jump in, maybe talk a little bit about the technology and a little bit about the problem space of what that technology was built for. It's a transition technology. I would suggest even taking a step even further back to say the whole reason for the discussion is the very exciting announcement, well, for sort of limited applications of the word exciting, I guess, but from Windows, from Microsoft rather, that Windows 11 is going to support something that we're referring to as CLAT here. Yeah. They even gave it a name. They called it (laughs) WinCLAT. (laughs) WinCLAT. Just to make it their own spin on it. But yes, that's exactly what they're doing, which we're super excited about. And this came about from some long efforts, I imagine, from a bunch of different organizations putting requests into Microsoft to get the support in. So let's talk about the problem space a little bit, about what you know 464 actually does, I guess, and why it came about. Because we've talked in the past on, on shows about DNS64 and NAT64 pretty extensively, I think, in terms of what this solves, which is basically the capability of a V6-only client to be able to talk to v4 only resources and use something called dns64 which is basically a dns name resolver that's going to lie to you and provide you a v6 prefix that it claims that particular service is available on that's available in ipv4 only and then uh, you end up going through a nat 6 to 4 gateway service in order to be able to go talk to that resource Uh, in short that's really what's going on there if you don't use dns for any given reason that solution is not going to work, right? So for some reason, you are have an app that's running around in your network, and, and maybe you're a large enterprise network, you built your own application, but they embedded an IPv4 address in there, whether it's RFC 1918 or a public v4 address, it doesn't need to do a DNS lookup, right? That's sort of the problem space. Um, and if it doesn't do a DNS lookup, it can't use DNS 6.4 to get a synthesized record to go connect to the thing via NAT 6.4, right? That's really the core fundamental. And so this is a problem all along for anything that's running on a V6-only network. And uh, this problem was solved by the mobile providers, right? And the mobile providers came up with principally with this solution. I think uh, Cameron up at T-Mobile was the original RFC author, right, for 4.6.4 XLAT, I think. Yeah, that's right. And this has been around for a long time now. We've been, we've had uh, 464 XLAT in the mobile space for over 10 years now. I think it's actually longer. Yeah. RFC 6877 is the number. And yeah, it's been in the mobile space for a long time because mobile carriers had an incentive to try to make handsets be V6 only devices and save not having to put a V4 address, private or public V4 address on a subscriber's phone. If they can run them V6 only, it's to their benefit. And if they could run a V6 only core network without V4, it's to their benefit. But there were still legacy applications on mobile phones that still were hard-coded somehow to IPv4. Yeah, whether they're making a direct socket connection to a V4 address or some legacy application still had an embedded IPv4 literal or something like that that then didn't trigger that DNS 6.4, they needed a method to handle that. That's right. And this is the operational model for mobile providers, uh, IPv6 only, to solve the problem of not having enough IPv4 addresses. So the dual stack configuration would not work for that particular environment. And of course, mm-hmm. for enterprises, if you go back to the time when mobile providers were connecting the dots and realizing IPv6 only was the way to go and recognizing the need for something like 464xlat, the idea of IPv6 only in the enterprise was uh, you know, pretty far-fetched. But flash forward a decade, and now we're looking at uh, very large enterprises that are recognizing that challenge of, you know, it's not enough to just dual stack everything and then still have to have uh, IPv4 addressing to put on everything that needs an address at the same time that you've configured it with IPv6. So the advantage and the appeal of an IPv6 only network is very much, you know, coming to the forefront for enterprise networks in, in the way that it hasn't before. And of course, in the federal space, that's you know, no small reason for that is that there's a mandate to do it. So uh, this is part of the architectural context in which this CLAT announcement is is exciting. 
Yeah. And as the name implies, 464X lat, it's taking a V4 something running inside of the computer, converts it within the mobile node or, or the laptop into a V6 connection. So it's doing translation. Then it's carrying that V6 connection across the service provider network or across the enterprise network to another translator, which is very similar to a, a NAT64 function that takes the V6 connection and converts it back into a V4 connection and then sends it out to the to the V4 service. It's translation. It's two little pieces of translation that are taking place, one on the customer device and one somewhere in the core of the network, the provider translator. It's translation, not encapsulation. One of the reasons that uh, this is sort of exciting is because while many enterprises would like to make use of DNS64 and NAT64, there are often times when they don't know if a particular application is doing the behavior of doing a direct socket call via IPv4. Like it's, it, it's usually not something that a host operating system team might be aware of that an application is doing. And so they're nervous and they want to be risk averse in terms of, of dealing with applications and moving to an IPv6 only network and saying like, well, we don't know every single app that might be running on a particular desktop. Can we have a built in suspenders approach to mitigate our risk? And this is why the, the announcement from Microsoft of supporting CLAT is so important because what it allows uh, these folks to do is to have basically the belts approach and the suspender approach around I've got DNS64 and NAT64, which is where I want the majority of my applications to behave correctly because they should be using DNS anyway. But for those that are misbehaving, <laughs> I guess, mm -hmm. uh, or do not behave compliantly in the way that we would think an application should behave um, and are doing V4 direct calls, this is the right suspenders portion of that conversation, which says like, okay, well, we've got this CLAT that operates in the platform and is able to handle that particular translation need requirement, we're still going to send it to the same NAT64 device that we're using for DNS64. So that really doesn't change, and the prefix is going to remain the same and everything else. But operationally, we now have a belt and suspenders approach for all the applications that would run on a given device, whether that's a mobile device, you know, whether that's Mac OS, Android, Linux, right? And now to be including Windows 11 at a later time, whenever they release done. Yeah, it's that safety net underneath the trapeze people in the circus, you know, is going to catch them if something happens. Something falls through the crack and tries to make a V4 connection, 464X LAT is going to be there to translate it, convert it, get it on its way to facilitate making the raw V4 connection actually work. This is great news because, and what's funny is that this code existed in, in the Windows OS for a long time, because if you had a laptop and you had a 4G or 5G mobile service on your laptop, in order for them to work on like T-Mobile's network, they needed to have this CLAC code in the OS to support when they connected to those networks to do exactly what we're talking about here, mm -hmm. which is to be able to solve that problem. If it wasn't a V6 only native service that you're connecting to, you needed to have like this little spoof IPv4 network on, on your OS that got then, you know, translated and encapsulated over to the NAT64 that the carrier was running. And so the code has been in Windows for a long, long time in order to support exactly that. It was just a matter of them enabling it on the wired LAN interfaces and any wireless interfaces that the host operating system would utilize. They just never turned it on for those particular interfaces before. And they never had trigger mechanisms. I guess that's an important mm -hmm. point too, is what actually triggers this sense of behavior. And uh, we'll probably have a whole separate show about all the different trigger mechanisms that could go on for this. But in short, you need something that sort of makes mm -hmm. the system aware that this needs to happen, right? That you want mm -hmm. to make use of the CLAT. And there are different options to be able to do this. But um, typically, the app isn't making a request for this, right? It's not something that the app would do. It's something that you sort of have to recognize in a separate way that this feature is, is something that you can go ahead and turn on because you need to recognize where the NAT64 mm -hmm. gateway service actually exists, right? Let's pause for just a moment to tell you about Human Infrastructure and Packet Capture, two weekly Packet Pushers newsletters you can subscribe to for free. Human Infrastructure delivers informative technical blogs, links to tech resources and tools, plus IT news stories and new product announcements, all with commentary by the Packet Pushers. There's also Packet Capture, a weekly digest of everything the Packet Pushers have published over the past seven days, including podcasts, blogs, and YouTube videos. It's an easy way to find the episodes and content you want. 
Sign up for one or both for free at packetpushers.net slash newsletters. We don't sell or share your email address with anyone. It's just between us. Yeah, and the mobile client has to learn what prefix is going to be used right. to carry the traffic across the V6 yeah. only core network. Yeah, it has to be taught what prefix to use, whether it's going to use the NAT64 well-known prefix or some network specific prefix that you know the network administrator is dictated is going to be used. Right. Yeah. So we have to give a little bit of metadata and there's different ways to sort of mm -hmm. pass along that metadata so that the host OS can behave correctly. Mm -hmm. Yep. For us, this is exciting news. I don't know if it's exciting for everyone else, but I think it's important to mention that the CLAT is a very proven, as Tom had mentioned earlier, about how long it's it's been around and in use. It's been in use for Android handsets for a long, long time because that was what it was principally built for, for T-Mobile's network, right? Apple yeah. chose to deal or address this issue differently. They went to their app store and basically said, you can't put an app in the app store unless it has IPv6 support in the mm -hmm. app. So it's a different way of tackling the exact same sort of problem space. Android chose to say, like, we're going to have this translation technology. We're going to use this 464X lat. We're going to put a CLAT in the Android handsets themselves, and they will be triggered to be able to understand or use the well-known prefix across these mobile networks to be able to get their traffic out to the IPv4 only portion of the internet, even though they're running on an IPv6 only network, which is what T-Mobile runs. And now T-Mobile Sprint, both networks were actually, you know, V6 native. So it doesn't matter. It'll work equally well across all of them. So it's important to point that out. There are other OSs that have CLAT support and can do this today. Mac OS has this built in, definitely can support it. You can do this with Linux. Scott, you said FreeBSD <laughs> has the capability. FreeBSD has IPFW, yeah. uh, CLAT, and FreeBSD 11.3. Yeah. So there's definitely pretty ubiquitous support. So with Windows adding this in in Windows 11, which I understand, I think they're trying to target before the end of the year here, which is just for clarification, 2024, they're talking like fall, if not winter of, of 2024, that they would have this released out. It's still a big deal for very large federal organizations that are trying to figure out how to get to V6 only on particular client networks, but are super concerned about applications that don't fit in the safe category of like, we don't know how this is going to behave. We don't know if it's going to work with DNS 64 and at 64, but we want to move our client networks over to IPv6 only. How do we do that in a safe manner? This is a big deal because the mass majority of, I think of many federal organizations are using Windows and Windows 11 is probably something they're in the midst of migrating over to. This yeah. means they would get CLAT support directly from Microsoft with the capability to support this. Obviously, Mac OS supports it, which is probably the second most common sort of platform they might have as a client device on a given network outside of mobile handsets. And uh, obviously, you don't need to do this for, for the Apple handsets because they're just going to talk V6 <laughs> natively directly mm -hmm. for all their apps. So that's it's not as big of a deal. And they can obviously make use of DNS 6.4 and at 6.4 automatically because they're using DNS first. Yeah, we tend to think of Windows 11 as a desktop, an enterprise operating system. But I guess this shows Microsoft's listening to their customers and seeing that enterprise customers do want to move to V6 only. And they need this functionality that has existed historically up to now in, in mobile service provider networks and on mobile OSs. So it's Microsoft listening to their customers and saying, ah, we need to give our enterprises the tools to move to V6 only, which is that final stage of the transition. Yep. So a little shout out to uh, Don Bernard and over at Microsoft. Thank you <laughs> for getting this done because I know you push very hard to make that happen if you're listening to the show. <laughs> but yeah, I'm excited about this. I guess the timing is is sort of a bit of an unknown, but if they reach their targets of, of releasing this out, a little inside baseball, we were very fortunate to be able to get a little bit of early code and see that it actually works, which is sort of exciting. You know, for those that are, we'll have to wait for the general Windows release to happen. Hopefully, fingers crossed, everything works as advertised and uh, we've got an extra tool in our tool belt to be able to get to IPv6 only in a, in a little bit less risky position set versus just DNS 64 and NAT64 as a tool in our tool belt. So I'm excited about that. One caveat to mention is Microsoft has said that this CLAT is intended for Windows 11, not Windows 10. Right. So maybe this would give their customers impetus <laughs> or reason <laughs> to upgrade from Windows 10 to Windows 11 if they need this. 
Well, if they're not going to put it in Windows 10, I guess I shouldn't hold out hope for Windows Vista or Windows XP then either. <laughs> Your Windows 95, <laughs> 95 and 98 <laughs> updates is, is where you should be targeting, Tom, is uh, get that pack boarded back there. <laughs> NT351. <Hey. 351. laughs> Windows 2000 Pro was the first Windows operating system I used IPv6 on. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, you had to load the whole separate network stack in there. Remember we had to do IPv6 install? Yep. Well, you know, if you go way back, you know, and you had to do your trumpet installation for getting a TCP IP stack in Windows, period. Trumpet windsock, yep. baby. Yep. 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 For sure. Well, hey, I mean, I think this is fantastic news. Uh, I think people should definitely keep track of it. There's actually, we'll drop a, a link in the show notes of the Microsoft blog post that talks specifically about this announcement uh, that was shared out. Very exciting news for those of us that are, uh, you know, trying to really work on getting to V6 only client configurations. Organizations have impact in that area. This is a great addition and something that really sort of helps in that problem space of of applications that maybe aren't homegrown or aren't behaving correctly in terms of the DNS side. This really sort of helps you uh, capture those last little bits so that you don't have something falling through the cracks, which is very cool. Thanks for joining us for this episode of IPv6 Buzz. If you've got feedback or a follow-up on this topic, send us a message at packetpushers.net slash FU. We'd love to hear from you and continue the conversation. Also, on packetpushers.net, you'll find a range of deep-dive technical podcasts for IT pros, including Heavy Networking, Heavy Wireless, and Day2 Cloud. There's a whole lot more on the Packet Pushers site as well, such as tutorial videos and a networking job board to help you find or fill your next great role. So whether you're deep in your career or just starting up, Packet Pushers is the place to go to grow both your skills and your personal network. So long and until next time, we'll see you on the IPv6 internet.